My name is Alfredo Salim, and I'll be your guide through this course and the many lessons that it will cover. We're currently reviewing the Structural Mechanics lesson. We are in the fifth recording of six recordings. Each of the recordings for this lesson lasts approximately one hour, so please use that to plan ahead for your study schedule. On this fifth recording, we're going to continue where we stopped on the last one and begin with the concept of steel properties. When we talk about steel and structural mechanics, we are referencing structural steel. It is produced to specify minimum mechanical properties. It is required by specific ASTM designations. There are three types of hot roll structural steel for use in buildings. We have carbon, high strength, low alloy, quenched and tempered alloy. Most structural steel is made from carbon steels. W shapes are typically a high strength, low alloy steel. Each steel type has a specific mechanical properties, which can be found in Table 2-3 of the AISC Steel Construction Manual. Now, for the We're going to reference a couple of ASTM standards, and of course, we just referenced the uh, AISC, the steel manual. Now, these are just to give you benchmarking ideas and to point you into different references that are used to go through the lesson. Now, for the breadth portion of the NCS BE exam, you do not need to reference the specific tables within the steel construction manual or the uh, different ASTM standards or testing methods. And I say that because on the breadth portion of the exam, NCS has not provided any specifications that require or reference a specific manual, standards, or codes. Now, this is for the breadth portion of the exam. The depth portion of this exam is a separate topic. Depending on which discipline you take, you may need to bring a specific type of textbooks, reference, or codes to uh, be able to answer problems in the depth portion of the exam. For the breadth portion of the exam, the majority of the data will be provided within the exam. Now, back to steel. Steel properties are independent of the type of steel. We have the modulus of elasticity and the density of steel. Now, we have steel properties that are dependent on the type of steel, and that will be the tensile strength and the yield stress. Tensile strength and yield stress also depend on the size and thickness of the steel piece that's being evaluated. The mechanical properties of structural steel are generally determined from tension tests on small specimens in accordance with different ASTM standard procedures. Table 58.1 Here we see Table 58.1 of CERN, which shows us typical properties of structural steels. Note how the modulus of elasticity doesn't depend on the grade of steel. It's going to be 29,000 KSI. Also note how the density of the steel does not depend on the grade of the steel, which is 490 pounds force per cubic feet. Now to get a grasp of density, the density of concrete is approximately 190 pounds force per cubic foot. Note how the, the yield strength depends on the grade of steel 
The tensile strength also depends on the grade of steel. You will see figure 58.1 of CERN. Let me zoom in a bit so you can get a better look of this figure full screen. A figure 58.1 shows the typical stress strain curves for different structural steels. Note on the vertical axis, we have the stress, which is in KSI. And on the horizontal axis, we have the strain, which is in inches per inches. Note the different curves represent different grades of steel. The tensile strength is often referred to as the ultimate strength of the steel. This is another key technical synonym that you may be asked to find one or the other, but still will be the same kind of solution, right? Because it's a technical synonym. If you're being asked to find the ultimate strength of the steel, that means you're being asked to find the tensile strength. The yield strength is the unit tensile stress at which the stress strain curve exhibits a well-defined increase in strain without an increase in stress. Here we have table 58.2, which gives us designations for different structural shapes of steel. So a W beam is a wide flange beam. An S beam is an American standard beam. HP means for bearing piles and represents a miscellaneous type of shape. C represents a standard channel. MC a miscellaneous channel. L represents an angle. WT or ST represents a structural T. TS represents structural tubing. HSS represents round or rectangular tubing. Pipe or P would represent pipe. PL represents plate. And bar represents bar. Each shape is ideally used in a specific application. Some shapes will work better as beams or as columns. And this is all based on the inertia in the X and Y directions. Usually, sections with similar or close inertia in both directions are used as columns. Sections with clear difference in inertia in both directions are used as beams. In addition to getting to know a little bit more in detail figure 58.2, you should understand the nomenclature used for each shape. For example, a W section is followed by its nominal depth and then by its weight. An angle is the long leg length followed by the short leg length. And finally, the thickness of the angle. Figure 58.3 of CERN shows how some sections can be combined. Back-to-back -back angles are used in diagonal members of trusses while the channel on top of the I-beam is commonly used to support the top flange against local. Here we see figure 58.2 of CERN that provides you with a description of what, a uh, graphical description of what the cross-section of each of these structural steel shapes represents. We can see the description of an S-shape, a W-shape, an HP-shape, an M shape, and then we see the description of a C shape, which is a channel, an L shape, which is an angle, or an MC shape. Then we have an ST, WT, and MT. And then we have our pipes, our HSS, and our plate shapes. In addition to that, we can have some, we can combine these shapes to provide us with a different type of beam or a different type of column, of a different type of structural member based, and we can basically combine these shapes to make the uh, moments of inertia work for the specific case that we're using. So you can see uh, two angles can be put back to back and almost form half of an I shape. Here we see 
that we can have a channel put on top of an S shape to uh, perhaps increase the moment of inertia at the top part of this structural membrane. Let's start going through the concept of material testing. And let's begin with concrete beams. Concrete beams are governed by ACI, the American Concrete Institute 318 guideline. Concrete carries compression normal stresses. Reinforcing steel carries the tensile stresses. The stirrups or bent bars carry the shear. Now, look at figure 50.1. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Remember the example of when we had our smiley bee, smiley bee, correct? So in our smiley bee, we have compression at the top, and then we have tension at the bottom of the bee. So what that means is concrete handles compression. So at the top, we don't need to put reinforcement. Now concrete cannot handle tension that well. So at the bottom where we have tension is where we need to put reinforcement. Because that's where we will have our tension. Using bent bars to resist shear is becoming less common due to the cost of bending rebar, which offsets the cost of the stirrups. Figure 51, 50.1b of CERN shows a bent bar in a beam due to a reverse curvature in the beam. This means that the tension phase of the concrete changes from one phase to the other. ACI 318 contains the specifications to design reinforcement to resist applied loads, as well as code minimums. This is the American Concrete Institute sec, uh, guideline 318. Now, it's good to know this for your professional practice and as well as a general reference for the exam, but you do not need to bring ACI 318 into the exam, into the breath exam, because uh, you will not need to look up any specific guidelines or applications within ACI 318. Now, there are some formulas and some, concept, and some concepts shown in ACI 318 that can help you in one or two problems in the P-exam. But please note the difference. You're not bringing it as a standard or as a reference that you need to look up a specific code or you'll be asked about a specific code or section within ACI 318. If you bring it as a reference for the breadth portion of the exam, you bring it to help you with a formula, to help you with an equation, to help you with a, an idea or a concept in the test, not as a standard reference. So let's continue with concrete beams. Now here we have figure 50.2, which shows a slab beam floor system. And then we can see at the bottom, the uh, moment diagram of a monolithic slab beam floor system. We can also see section AA and section BB that gives us some information on the cross section of this monolithic slab beam type of system. The effective shape of the concrete beam is defined by the shape of the section in compression, as we can see in figure 50.2. Now figure 50.2b and 52.c show examples of T-beam. These beams are often used to reduce the amount of concrete in an overhead application, such as in the floor and roof of a parking garage. This reduces a large portion of the dead load on the floor system. Please be aware that in positive moment regions, the compression block can be either in the phalange of the beam or in the phalange and web of the beam. Reinforced concrete sections can be singly or doubly reinforced. Doubly reinforced sections are used when concrete in the compression zone 
cannot develop the required moment strength. Now for concrete beams, we have two types of design. We have allowable strength, stress design, and then strength design. Now allowable stress design, which is also known as ASD. We use this, and the way we use it is when stresses are induced in the concrete and the steel are estimated. It assumes that the behavior is linearly elastic. Members are sized so that computed stresses do not exceed certain predetermined factors of safety. Now for the strength design is what we call the load and resistance factor design or LRFD. The loads are factored up and material strengths are factored down. LRFD is also known as strength design. Although both met methods produce adequate designs, LRFD is considered to be more rational. ACI 318 no longer contains provisions for ASD. Load factors will always be greater than or equal to 1.0. Resistance factors will always be less than or equal to 1.0. ASD loads are used for serviceability. For example, when we calculate deflections. Now, ASD is more like the old method of doing design. LR LRFD is the new method that's been in place for, it's not so new now, it's been in place for, I think, close to two decades, if not a little bit more. So you can see why now LRFD is already matured and you can see important manuals like the ACI no longer uh, provide information about ASD type of designs. Now, in concrete beams, we need to uh, determine the surface loads, which are the loads, both forces or moments or couplings, expected to be imposed on a structure during its full service life. Now, they are taken from building codes for design purposes. Factor loads, which are the surface loads increased by various amplifying load factors. The factor loads are designated using the subscript U as ultimate. The moment and shear due to the factor loads are MU and VU, respectively. Factors vary from one standard to the other based on the uncertainty expected. Factor loads can also be thought of as the required strength. Now here we see some of the low combina combinations for strength design. We have dead and life loads. We have equations 50.1 and 50.2 of CERN. We have 1.4 Ds or dead load, or the combination of 120% uh, of the dead load plus 160% of the life load. And it also considers dead, life, and windows. And these are shown through equations 50.3 through 50.5 of CERN. These factors are, control, are according to the American Concrete Institute. These load combinations are very similar to the load combinations specified in ASC, uh, SCI 7. The current version of ASC uh, SEI that is referenced in the exam is ASE SEI 7, which uses an ultimate wind load. Therefore, the load factor in ASE 7 is factored down. Now, ASE SEI 7 is specified in the exam, but for the structural depth portion of the exam. For the breadth portion of the exam, you do not need to look up any specific values or tables at one of these references in order to solve a problem. Now, an exam problem might present a list of loads to be factored correctly. Equations 50.2 through equation 50.5 are very useful in this regard.
Now, we also have load combinations for strength design that take into account earthquake loads. And these are shown in equation 50.6 and 50.7 of CERN. Now, D is equals to the dead load. E equals the earthquake load. H equals the earth pressure. L equals the life load. W equals the wind load. And the other loads that can be considered include F for the fluid load. L sub R for the life roof load, R for the rain load, S for the snow load, and T for the temperature, shrinkage, creep, and settlement loads. Earthquake loads have a factor of 1.0 because they are ultimate level events. ASCE SCI 7 now considers wind an ultimate level event. And therefore, wind also has a load factor of 1.0. Now, the strength design criteria when we deal with concrete beams considers a nominal strength, which is the maximum loading can be moment and or shear that a section can sustain. Nominal strength is the maximum loading that a section can sustain. Design strength is the reduction in the nominal strength using a strength reduction factor. The nominal moment and shear strength are known as M sub N and V sub N, respectively. The nominal moment and shear capacities of a concrete section depend on the cross section as well as the steel reinforcement. The steel reinforcement includes steel resisting normal stresses, longitudinal steel in the beam, and like another example, a steel resisting shear stresses, such as shear stirrups in a beam. Reduction factors for concrete vary from 0.65 to 0.9. The reduction factors closer to 0.65 are applied when brittle failures, shear compression, control the failure mechanism of the member. Larger reduction factors are applied when Ductile failures uh, control the failure mechanism of the member. Now, reinforced concrete beam deflection is due to immediate and long term deflections. Immediate deflection is a result of the strains induced by the applied loads. Long-term deflection is due to creep and shrinkage of the concrete. Total deflection is a summation of both immediate and long-term deflections. Immediate deflections are calculated using the same equations used to calculate the deflections in structural analysis. The biggest difference is that unlike with a steel beam, the moment of inertia of a concrete beam is not calculated directly. Now, for deflection in concrete beams, you need to identify that the concrete cracking occurs when the bending moment exceeds the cracking moment. Concrete cracking will happen when the bending moment in the beam exceeds the cracking moment, which is shown in equation 50.44 of CERN. Let me zoom in so you can get a better look at these equations. The effective moment of inertia is assumed to be constant along the entire beam length. ACI 318 specifications contain a simplified method shown in equation 50.43 of CERN. For a rectangular cross section, we can see that y sub t is going to equal to half of the height. The modulus of rupture is known as f sub f and it's the stress at which the concrete is assumed to crack. I subscript G is the cross moment of inertia, which for a rectangular can be the bottom width times the height uh, to the power of 3 over 12. MA is the bending moment in the beam being analyzed. Now, since cracking is not rever reversible, MA should be taken as the largest bending moment due to service loads. Y sub t is the distance from the center of gravity of the cross-section to the extreme tension fiber. 
Essentially, the cracking moment takes a percentage of the crack moment of inertia and the gross moment of inertia based on how cracked the section is due to the bending moment in the section. Now here we see the equation for the modulus of rupture. And this is given in equation 50.45 of SIR. Lambda is the lightweight aggregate factor. It is generally 0 0.75 for all lightweight concrete, 0 0.85 for sand lightweight concrete, and 1.0 for normal weight concrete. The modulus of rupture is different from the tensile spinning strength of the concrete, although these values should be relatively close, and in everyday design, they used interchangeably. However, you should be aware that these values may be different uh, when you're asked to solve a problem in the PE exam. Now for the long-term deflection of concrete beams. We know this is due to creep and shrinkage. It's fast at first and then it slows down. And typically it will finish in about five years. ACI 318 equations will govern this long-term deflection. And you can see them in CERN in, through equations 50.46 and 50.47. Let me zoom in so you can get a better look. Now, total deflection is the sum, simply, of the instantaneous deflections plus any long-term deflections. Now, according to ACI 318, the long-term deformation, delta A, is obtained by multiplying the immediate deflection produced by the sustained portion of the load by an amplification factor. Where I equals 1.0 at 3 months, 1.2 at 6 months, 1.4 at 1 year, and 2 at 5 years or more. Rho prime equals the compression steel ratio. Now, in computing the sustained part of the immediate deflection, judgment must be used to decide what fraction of the prescribed service load can be assumed to be acting continuously. Now, steel beams. Standard hot roll shapes for steel beams their cross sections include W shapes, S shapes, M's, channels, T's, and L shapes. They are built up members and can be built using standard shapes. Here we see figure 59.9, which provides us an overall nomenclature and terminology for steel W shaped beams. We have the phalanges, we have the web, we have the bottom width of the phalange, we have the thickness of the web. We have the height between the phalange plates, and we have the depth of the beam, and we have TF, which represents the thickness of the phalange. Each shape will have a specific purpose or situation for which it is best suited. Now, some examples of these specific applications include W shapes are sections that carry the flexure in the phalanges and shear in the webs. Square HSS piles are sections that are stable columns because they're equally strong in both directions. L angles are used for ledgers to support vertical loads framing into a wall. Being aware of some of the benefits of each shape can help examinees narrow down answer options on the exam. Each shape has some disadvantages that must be accounted for by the designer. For example, channels tend to roll when loaded on the channel's flange. This is due to the shear center not being in the same spot as the centroid of the member. 
As a result, channels often require horizontal bracing or some lateral support to keep them from rolling when loaded. Now for steel beams, we have different types of cross sections. We have doubly symmetric shapes, which are the most efficient. We have channels, which have good flexural strength, but they have poor lateral strength. We have decent angles, which are suitable only for light loads. Shapes that have double symmetry include the W shape, the S shape, and the M shape section. Now try to consider why T's and angles are only good for light loads. See, T's have relatively low moments of inertia. Their mass is close to the center of the section. This is a benefit when they are used for tension bracing in the structure. Tension bracing is only dependent on the cross-sectional area of the member. This is another example of how different shapes are better suited for various types of loading. Now for steel beams, we also have the allowable stress design, such as what we have for concrete beams. Now the allowable stress design focuses on determining the nominal flexural strength. And then, to do that, we need to determine a compact section and a section with adequate lateral support. Now, the design strength is the nominal flexural strength that is modified by the safety factor for bending. And we can see the different equations using ASD and the AI. SC code through equation 59.1 of CERN and 59.2 of CERN. Now in this equation, C represents the plastic section modulus. This is different from the elastic section modulus, S, which is equal to the moment of inertia divided by the distance from the centroid of the section to the extreme fiber of the section. Compact sections are sections where local buckling of the member will occur prior to the member reaching its full capacity. Compact sections can be designed using the structural principles without considering local buckling. Compact sections are more common in the breadth portion of the exam. Equation 59.4 and equation 59.5 of CERM can be used to determine the compactness of a section. ASD and LRFD are both commonly used in steel design. And for steel beams, we have the strength design of LRFD. Nominal strength is modified by the resistance factor for bending. As you can see, how that is accomplished through equation 59.3 of CERN. M is the moment due to the loads, and theta B equals 0 0.9 per the AISC specifications ANSI dash AISC 360. In equation 59.3, factors are applied to both the load and the resistance. That is why the method is called load and resistance factor design, LRFD, load and resistance factor design. LRFD for steel is similar to using LRFD for concrete. The only difference between the two systems is that the resistance factors vary for the limit stated in each material, and those limits are the failure mechanisms for each material. So let's go through a problem. To uh, 
test the different concepts that we have reviewed so far. And this is problem six of the structural mechanics lesson. So let's go to it. A simply supported compact beam carrying a uniformly distributed load is constructed from a homogeneous material that can withstand a maximum allowable tensile stress of 1600 kilonewtons per square meter. The beam is 30 centimeters wide. We can see the uh, uniformly distributed load, it's 10 kilonewtons per meter. And this load acts through the entire length of the beam. We can see that the beam has two connections, a pin connection and a roller connection. And the distance between the connections is four meters. We're being asked most nearly, what is the minimum required thickness for this beam? We're being told how wide the beam is. Now we need to find what is the minimum required thickness. Is it 0.3 meters, 0.4 meters, 0.5 meters, or is it 0.6 meters? Now, if you would like to solve this problem using the concepts that we have reviewed so far, I would encourage you to please go ahead and pause the video at this stage before we get into the solution. Now, as a hint, you may want to use CERM Appendix 44A, which shows the calculation of beam, shear, flexure, and deflection diagrams. The problem only addresses the tensile strength stress in the beam. This should be a clue to students that shear is not being designed for. This problem could be modified to require designing for shear and or deflection. Appendix 44.A within CERM is something that you should tap right away. This appendix will be your guide to solve many, many different types of structural uh, mechanics problems within the PXM, especially when you're dealing with beams, with the loading of beams. Note that Appendix 44A is about three pages long, and it provides you with many different cases of load applications and boundary conditions. So let's start with the first one. We have case one. Case one includes a cantilever beam that has a fixed support and has a point load at the very, very edge of the beam. We can see the shear diagram the moment diagram and the deflection diagram. Note the equation shown here to find the deflection or the moment or the maximum moment or the shear for case one. Note how this can simplify quite a bit out of uh, trying to come out with these formulas to solve this problem. Case two shows a cantilever beam with a uniform load. Note the shear diagram, the moment diagram, and the deflection diagram. Note that you also have the equations for all these different parameters, the maximum shear, the maximum moment, and the deflection, and the maximum deflection. One key formula here is something that NCS loves to test about on the exam. It's ask, it asks you to find the deflection at a specific point along the beam. You can see how the YX can help you solve for that. Note your origin on these beams. They all start at the left. So this is your coordinate system of zero comma zero. You see how you will get the measurement of X to calculate the deflection at a specific point along the beam. Now let's look at case three, which shows a cantilever beam 
with a triangular load. So case 1, 2, 1, 3 are for cantilever beams. Are uh, basically fixed with a fixed support at one end only. And the other end is a free support. Note the shear diagram, the moment diagram, and the deflection diagram. Case 4 starts going into a combination of different supports. We have a fixed support on the right and we have a pin support on the left. Now, one thing to uh, point out is that NCS may try to ask your problem in any of these cases and show you a mirror image. So for example, in case 3, they can show you a uniform load on a cantilever beam but they will show the fixed support on this side and the free end on this side, which will be a mirror image of this, um, of this condition. So realize that and note that you can also use the formulas to find those values as well. Now for this prop cantilever with a uniform load, we can see the pin connection and we can see the uh, fixed connection. Note the difference in the shear diagram. Because we have a support, we're going to have a reaction, a vertical reaction at that support point. So that will create us to have a positive shear towards the end or towards the beginning of the beam. And then as we get to the uh, fixed end support, we can see that we'll have a negative shear, but the peak, the, uh, the maximum negative shear will be less than if we, if we didn't have a pin support. Also note the uh, moment diagram and the diagram for deflection. Now this is appendix 44A continued. Now we're going through case five, which shows the cantilever beam with an end moment. Note the different uh, way to calculate the shear. Shear is zero because we, on, we only have a coupling or an end moment. Note the uh, end slope and the maximum moment and how that can be found. We have K6 which shows a simple beam with a center load. This is one of the most common loading uh, problems that you may find on the morning portion of the exam, on the breath portion of the exam. And look at our smiley beam. So for this beam, if it's a concrete beam, where would you put the reinforcement? The reinforcement will be put at the bottom because that's the part that's in tension. The top part is in compression. Just went a little bit too far. Here we have K7 and K8. K7 shows a point load with two pin supports and it's just applied a little bit off center. K8 shows two loads that are uh, equally spaced at the, uh, at the outside. They have an equal distance from the two fixed end supports. Note the difference in the shear diagram. This beam experienced no shear at its middle section. Then we have case 9, which shows us a simple beam with uniform load. Then the last, we have a simple beam with a triangular load. Now we're going into case 11, where we have a simple beam with an overhung load. Note the two reaction. This is almost acting as a cantilever beam, but it has two types of pins. It's being braced at the top, and it's being braced at the bottom. Now here we have another case, which is the one that we did a couple of practice problems in an earlier recording for this structural mechanics lesson. 
we have two pin connections, and we have a distributed load. Now the key thing to note about these pin connections is that they might as well be roller connections to some of these. Uh, they might as well be roller connections for these different applications. And the reason I say that is because we don't have any horizontal loads being applied to this beam. So really being a pin connection doesn't mean that we're going to have a horizontal reaction. So now back to our problem. Note the uniform distributor load and how we have a pin connection and a roller. We don't have any horizontal forces acting on the beam, therefore we will not have any horizontal reactions. Let me quickly switch back to CERN so you can see what case will apply to this kind of problem. On an appendix, uh, 44A, it will be case 9. So we're being asked to find what is the minimum required thickness for this beam. So let's go 